verses from Genesis chapter 15. God had called Abraham already to leave the country of his nativity and to go on out to another land. Where? God says, I'm not telling you. Just go. So he went. And as he was going, where are you going, Abram? Abram, I should say. He wasn't called Abraham till later. Oh, I don't know. Oh, come on. You, you just don't do that. No, I don't know. But God said he'd show me. And so that was enough for Abram. That'll show me. So he went out and you know the story how he found himself up in Haran with his father and with his nephew Lot and lived there for some time till God reminded him of the promise. I said, get thee out from thy country and from thy kindred. So after his father was dead, he moved out again. Where? He didn't know, but God would lead him. Lot went with him. And uh, so here he was down in the land of promise. And yet Abraham was still waiting. Still waiting for God to show him the land. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. I want to talk a little bit about vision, Lord willing. I've never had a vision or a meaningful dream that I'm aware of, but... um, doesn't mean I don't have vision. Uh, I believe God wants us all to have a vision. He wants us to see. He wants us to see with uh, His eyes and hear with His ears. And he wants us to be aware and to value those things that God evaluates, like we've been mentioning, with a proper perspective. And uh, Peter says, you lack vision. You're, you're blind and short-sighted. If after you have received faith from God, you're not adding to your faith virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love, he says, you're lacking vision. And I trust God will burn it into our hearts that the ultimate in all these things that God promises is love. It's not just some good sentimental thing you need to to get other things to work, to get your ministries to work, and to be effective in ministry. Love is the ultimate. Love is far more powerful than any gift, far more powerful than any ministry. And God is going to demonstrate that. That just in the love of God pouring forth, people are going to be healed. They're going to cripples are going to rise up and walk. Not because some powerful ministry stands there with a gift of miracles, but because of the love flowing forth from God's people. They'll go into mental institutions where people are demonized. You won't have to take along someone who's a specialist in discerning evil spirits or and I'm not despising that. I know God has used those who have that kind of discernment. But when a people walk into those places, I mean, filled with the love of God, the demons are going to cry out in fear. They're going to run from those individuals when the love of God draws now. We're going to see great waves of healing to a people who are simply a priestly people Filled with mercy and compassion. 
walking in this world of evil and wickedness and demonized with all the forces of darkness. Because darkness can't stand the light. Darkness and light cannot coexist. When Jesus, the Prince of Light, comes, the Prince of Darkness is in trouble and he knows it. The spirits cry out, what, what are you doing here? Are you going to destroy us before the time? They knew they had a time of doom awaiting them. But here's one that <coughs> seemingly has come ahead of time. And they, they become aware of him. And we're not troubling the world of evil too much. Because we don't have enough of God yet. I mean, we don't have enough of the love and mercy and compassion of Christ to trouble them too much. Because they're troubled when they come in the presence of Him who is love. A little story comes to me, I think I'll relate. Up our way, there's a friend of mine who has been working amongst the Native Indians. He was down to a convention of the natives and in that fellowship there of Christians there had been a certain bitterness because one of their children was taken up to the sweat house to be treated by the medicine man and and the child died and uh, there was some bitterness there involved with the Christian community and they started to preach love and forgiveness and they sat there cold, but as the word went forth, the Lord broke them and they repented and they said, yes, we forgive them. And, and there was uh, the Spirit of God confirmed uh, the repentance and everything was lovely. But the next night, the ministry continued. It's one thing to forgive, but you've got to love. Well, now that's yeah, we can forgive them, you know, and try and erase it from our mind, but that, that's going a little bit far, isn't it? I mean, that was the thought that was evident. And as the ministry of the Word continued to dwell on that thought of forgiveness is one thing, I forgive what you did, but I love you and mean it. And he said, yes, we will. We will love them. And don't forget that love it's not just a feeling, it's a commitment. And God will help you to fulfill that commitment if it is genuine. And so they said, yes, we love those people. But they didn't leave it at that. Some of them went up there, I don't know, some miles I believe, to affirm not only that they had forgiven them, but that they loved them. And they went up and they talked to the medicine man himself and they said, we forgive you for what you've done and we love you people. He went back home. A few days later, the medicine man came down. He said, no, I, I really shouldn't be doing this. But he says, I felt I had to come and tell you. I don't care what kind of power you Christians got. We can match anything you've got in our culture. But he says, when you start talking about love, we know nothing about that. The world of darkness knows nothing about that. Not God's love. The only power the world of darkness has is negative. Fear, suspicion, doubt, unforgiveness, lack of mercy, darkness, anything pertains to the realms of darkness. The only power they got. You say it's awesome power. It is to those who are living in that realm. But it ought not to be to those who are dwelling in light. It's just negative. And I know we feel the effects of that negative kind of power in the world because we're not, we don't have enough of God's love. And when we come into that ultimate that God has for His people, perfect love, <laughs> Cast out all fear. He says, we can match any power you got. But when you talk about love, we, we don't know anything about that. He says, if you continue, if you persist in that, you're going to win. 
But they said, we'll be watching you. We've heard of that before, but we'll be watching you. Thank God there's a great move amongst the Native Indians here in America and up in our land. And I've ministered to many congregations of them and they receive this word without any problem, the ones I've ministered to. They love it. And yet out there in the church, I'm sort of an oddball and far out. And, well, God, I'm telling you, he's going to... He's going to manifest his glory amongst the poor and the rejected and the despised of this world. Expect God to move mightily amongst the native people, amongst the black people, amongst the Mexicans, amongst those who are particularly maybe despised or rejected by the fashionable church. If God does that to provoke his people who have known him for so long to provoke them to jealousy. And so God is, he's got great things in store for his people. Another native friend of mine told me about a native Indian way up in northern Vancouver Island who saw a vision of God moving mightily in the, in the, amongst the native people all over the continent. God was moving tremendously. And May God, as that work begins, begin to provoke the church to jealousy. Who have settled back with the thought, we're God's people, this is God's chosen nation, we're the, we've, uh, you know, the church in America is the great church. <laughs> and, uh, we're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And God is going to sh- show this church in this land and in ours how bankrupt we really are. Would to God we could declare bankruptcy now. Because God has hope for those who are bankrupt. He's got everything he needs. But as long as you've got your bank vault filled with all kinds of paper money that isn't worth a thing, and you think you're rich, what can God do for us? That's just a little in passing. God said, Fear not, Abram, I'm thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Abraham had been getting concerned because God said, I'll show you the land and I'll give you a seed and I'll make of you a great nation and through you all nations will be blessed and the longer he waited, the dimmer the promise seemed to become. Why does God keep us waiting so long? Why is God always late in everything He does from your standpoint and mine? Because we don't see things as God sees them. Our ways are not His ways. Our thoughts are not His thoughts. And He keeps us waiting. Because his real work is in those to whom he gives the promises. That's where he really wants to do the work. Of course, when you get the promise, you feel, well, fine, Lord, when? Well, not today. Next week, maybe? Next month? God doesn't tell us. And so he keeps us expecting every day. But expectations soon were sin and Lord, you promised this when you're going to do it. God says, don't fear, Abraham. I'm your shield. I'm your exceeding great reward. Yeah, but God, uh, what are you going to give me seeing I die childless and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? But Abraham, didn't you hear? I'm your shield and thy great reward. Yeah, but what are you going to give me, God? Strange how we can hear the word of God and yet not hear it. God, the Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, the owner of galaxies and stars and the whole world, he says, I'm, I'm your reward, Abraham. Yeah, what are you going to give me? I was telling some of the men around the table, you know, all my life I felt I was to be a minister. Felt that call was there from earliest days of childhood. And so that became my vision. 
go to school. I won't necessarily go to university as long as I know how to read and write. And I don't have to learn all that stuff in college because I'll be a minister. And because I never did believe, you know, I'd have to go to theological seminary or anything like that. I never did. But um, ministry was the call was strong in my life, so I was just waiting. I wasn't saved even then, but 19 years of age, I gave my heart to the Lord. And, well, now I'm on the way. Maybe get the baptism one of these days, and then I'm on my way. And waited a couple of years for that. Well, now what, Lord? And you know, ministry, ministry, ministry. You know, that became the vision. Well, I guess I have to wait a while. Jesus was 30 before he went out. So 30 comes and goes and well, 40 is quite a magic number in scripture. Uh, 40 comes and goes and 50 comes and goes. And uh, when I take a job, well, you know, I believe I'll be in ministry someday. Oh, is that right? And so I just want to let you know, you know, so if I leave, I'll give you a notice, you know. Oh, no problem. So, what happens all that time? I'll tell you what happens as we go along. What are you going to give me? And so God told him to make the sacrifices. He said, we're going to cut a covenant. And... That was the word that they used in those days when they made an agreement. They would cut a covenant. They'd take the sacrifice, cut it, lay the parts out side by side. And then the two who walked in covenant agreement would walk between the parts and that was sealing the covenant. And so God says, well, get the sacrifice ready. A heifer of three years old, a she goat of three years old, a ram of three years old, a turtle dove and a young pigeon and so forth, spread them out, get them all ready. And the fowls started to come down in the covenant, but Abraham couldn't do anything until God came along. The two of them had to go together, down between the parts, and that was what confirmed the covenant. And so in the meantime, what could he do but wait for God? Abraham lived a life of waiting. But let me tell you, if you're waiting in God's purpose and in God's design it's not in vain they shall not be ashamed who wait for him and Abram had to wait there was, he couldn't do anything about it it takes two to make a covenant and so the carcasses were laid out and the sacrifice was ready all he needed now was God We're great in getting ready, everything ready for God to come. We can get everything highly organized for God to come. And I know God told him to do that, so I'm not saying he was doing wrong in that. But somehow it looked like he was uh, depending a lot on God and Abram walking together through the parts. And he had to protect the sacrifices, so he drove the birds away. They'd come down after he was wearing himself out driving the birds away and God was late, as he always is. As he always is, from your standpoint and mine. He's not there when we think he should be there. Always late. He gave the promise to our parents away back in Eden. Soon after they'd sinned, a seed shall bruise the serpent's head. And they waited and waited and waited for that. He burned into Moses' heart a promise of delivering the children of Israel. God put it in his heart. And he assumed that the people of God would recognize that God had raised him up to be their deliverer. After all, he was one of them. And now he was in politics. And he was right up there near the king. Pharaoh of Egypt. So he was in a good position to deliver his people. So you people had a Christian president. You had great hopes. And you're always hoping you'll get a Christian president. Maybe there'll be some, something come out of this and we get a Christian in there. 
Let me tell you something. God's not going to use your political system to do what he's doing in the earth. Because we can go directly to the king of all kings and the president of all presidents of this world and of the heavens. Go direct to him. If we want to go through the political channels and maneuver to try and get righteousness in the land, it's not going to work until righteousness flows from the body of Christ, which will be... A It will be what the word I'm looking for. It will be a torment to the inhabitants of the earth when God's righteousness flows from Zion. So why do I say that? Because they hated Jesus because he was a man who displayed the righteousness and love and truth of God. That's why they hated him. He says, they can't hate you, but me they hated because I testify of it that its works are evil. They hated the two witnesses in Revelation because they were tormenting the people with plagues. You say, well, that doesn't sound like a very Christian thing to torment the people of the earth if they were God's witnesses. They were tormenting them because they were standing for righteousness and truth. And the world hates God and its Christ and truth and righteousness. When you and I come into truth and righteousness and Godliness and holiness, the world will hate us as violently as they hated Jesus. Say, we're living in a different kind of country. You're not. The same prince of evil reigns over this country that reigns over any other country. And the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not. Let the light shine. When the light shines, they're going to hate the light and they're going to yield to it and come to Christ or they're going to resist it with all that's in them. But we're going to win like that. Made a man soon. We're going to, said we're going to win because God is raising up a people who are going to walk in the light. We're going to walk clothed upon the light of Jesus. We're going to win because he's already conquered. We go into this battle knowing we've already won. Not to find out whether we'll win or not. So we need that kind of vision. Anyway, just he waited and waited till the sun was down. And as it was going down, Abraham fell asleep. A deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. A deep sleep and a horror of great darkness. And God said to Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. Also that nation whom they shall serve, I will judge, and after it they shall come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp passed between those pieces. While Abraham was asleep, with a sleep that God put upon him, God went through the pieces as a burning lamp and a smoking furnace. God was saying, in effect, Abraham, I know we're cutting a covenant and you should be here walking by my side, but I'm doing this and you're having nothing to do with it. You're the recipient of it, but otherwise you can't lay your finger on anything that I'm doing. I know there's a sleep of death, there's a sleep of lethargy, but there's a sleep that God, by his own presence, puts upon his people when he is determined that man will not get any glory out of it. That no man could say, well, I helped God there. I, I was there and I helped God, like they're saying today. Daniel was in a deep sleep upon his face when the angel visited him. Adam 
God put him to sleep when he would bring forth a bride. Adam longed for that bride. He looked about and saw nothing in all the works of God's hands that was compatible with himself. Wondered a little about it because every creature had its mate, but he couldn't see anything that appealed to him. Until God put him to sleep. Out from his side while Adam slept, God brought forth this beautiful bride to be his help meet his counterpart. And he said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. God did the same with the last Adam. He did the same, is doing the same because the bride is not yet fully formed. But he put the bridegroom to sleep that there as Jesus slept in the sleep of death, God was bringing forth out of his wounded side a holy bride totally compatible with himself, not the work of man in any sense of the word, a new creation after the hand of God. My substance was not hid from thee, David said, and I used to read that. David was saying it and he knew he knew he was speaking of something else. When I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, thine eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there were none of them. It is vain for you to rise up early and sit up late. What's that preceded by? Except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build it. Vain for you to rise up early, sit up late, trying to get this house built. Like they're doing, wearing themselves out to build God's house. God says, I'm putting you to sleep when I build my house with the sleep that God puts upon us. In other words, God is working tremendously right now in this hour and we're not aware of it. We're not aware of the intricate working that God's doing in the lowest parts of the earth. Intricate working, curiously wrought, speaks of fine needlework, I understand. That pattern is being wrought in the texture of that, of that cloth by God's own handiwork. For we are God's creation. We are God's new creation. You and I know very well that only God could make this beautiful earth in which we live and cast the galaxies and stars and planets in their orbits. And we wonder at God's beauty, God's handiwork. But we're going to wonder more and the world is going to wonder more and the heavens are going to wonder more when God brings forth his holy bride the church of Jesus Christ, and they'll know it's God's creation. They'll know that man had nothing to do with it. That God, by his own intricate workings in the lives of his people, was able, out of the old creation, to take a, a, a lump of the old Adam out of the old creation and so work on that old lump that he might bring forth a new creature, his holy bride, a new creation, totally compatible with the Lord Jesus Christ, not inferior as the church thinks. It's got to be inferior because you always got to have sin after all. Totally like Jesus in his purity and holiness and love and compassion, yet always subject to him. Isn't that the way we want it? Always subject to Jesus? So this movement then to make man and woman equal, that's going rampant all over the world, it's Antichrist. Because God made the order. Woman, man, Christ. And don't put another mediator in there like some are doing. Woman, man, and then the apostles or the prophets or this covering or, or that order. Paul doesn't put that in there. 
head of the woman is the man, the head of man is Christ, and the head of Christ is God. That's the order. What's ministry then? What are they for? <clears throat> to minister that mediator. To minister from the heart of that mediator. That all of God's people might have free access to God. To so minister the truth to God's people that you and your own life, man, woman, child, boy, girl, might have free access to the throne of God through Jesus Christ without going through any other mediator but the one. So God has set in the church these ministries, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, to ministry. So ministers Christ to the people that they become ministers themselves. I'm not talking about clergy, clergymen. I'm talking about having a function in the body of Christ which you all are, must have. That's what ministry is for. Apostles, prophets, evangelists to so minister Christ that every individual will bud forth in that particular ministry that God has ordained them for. Till eventually we all come unto the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. And I don't waste my time analyzing the word perfection. That means maturity. It means coming to fullness, to completeness. But Paul describes exactly what he means when he says coming into a perfect man. He describes exactly what he means. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's his explanation. Uh, people say, oh no, it just means mature. You're, you're a mature Christian now, you know, and you don't get as mad as easily as you used to and you've got more love. But Paul tells us the standard that God goes by, the measure that God goes by. They even have departments in the government that are very concerned about measurement. They've got a standard there. A foot is so much, and you mustn't vary from that. You put out, I suppose, millions of these tapes, 10, 20, 30 foot long, and they've got to meet that standard. So they're all the same. Got to meet that standard. And God has a standard that he has for his people, and he's put ministry in the church to bring it forth. And the standard is the measure of the stature of Christ. The fullness of it. The fullness of Christ. It's too much for us because we think we have something to do with it. It's God's creative word that's going to do it. When God formed foreign man, <coughs> pardon me, when God formed man, dust of the ground, formed the man, he breathed into him the breath of life. He became a living soul and stood to his feet. Fresh from the hand of God. He didn't evolve. He, God created him the way he is. And then, like we said, when he made his bride, his counterpart, he put Adam to sleep to bring Eve out of Adam. That it might always be known that they are one. They are one. The one coming out from the other. Out from his side to be always by his side. A new creature and yet one. With the man from whom she came. We don't find that too difficult. Nor have we heard until recent times that Eve and Adam were equal after all. They had equal opportunity, equal life, same kind of life, same nature, same kind of human character, but God established an order. For the benefit of the human family, for the benefit of Eve herself, for the benefit of their children. And so you can see it is as this equality spreads throughout the earth, how families are just being broken and there's families are no longer important. Or, I mean, such anarchy, such anarchy in the home has developed. 
to this false notion that we just evolved and uh, through some kind of a process of evolution we are where we are now we must go on and on until you know man becomes his own god anyway I didn't intend to get into that either but we have that vision that God's going to do what he said and that when God declares his word in the earth, sends it forth, he will not take it back till he performs the intention of his heart. I didn't finish that thought the other night. But I mentioned how that Jesus became the word, the incarnate word, the ultimate word that was faithful unto death to do the will of God. And though when he came to the hour when he must face the agonies of the cross, the burden rested upon him. Oh, I don't think it is so much the fact he would be crucified as the fact that in that moment he would bear upon his own holy head the burden and the weight of the sins of all mankind. A cup that was too heavy for him to, too poisonous for him to drink, so it seemed. But he was faithful to do it. And because he was faithful to do that, faithful to be the seed that would go down to the ground and die, God raised him from the dead and enthroned him in his own right hand in the heavenlies. He left the world, the Father, and came into the world. Again, he says, I leave the world and go back to the Father because he finished the work. He was the word that God sent. God said, I can't take that word back until the work is accomplished. He accomplished the work. The word, he accomplished the work. He said, I finished it, Father. I finished the work. And so the Father took him back. But, he sent forth that word again. This time, not a man incarnate, but the spirit inhabiting a people in the earth. And that spirit was the same spirit that was in Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said, I'm sending you the spirit of truth. Same spirit that was in Jesus. Comes forth when he was ascended. He finished the work. The word went back. God sends forth the word again. This time, the spirit of truth. To abide in the earth. In the earth. The earth that you are. The earth that I am. And God is saying, I will not take the Spirit of God back until he has fulfilled the mandate for which I sent him into the earth. He's God's word in the earth. The Spirit of truth in the earth once again. man phoned three or four years ago. He wanted to talk to me. I'm glad I wasn't in. But he said, Lord, show me. The Spirit of God is going to be taken out of the earth this fall. Oh, I'm glad I didn't talk to him. I knew it wasn't going to happen. He's here in the earth. He brings forth the purpose for which God sent him. To bring forth a glorious church and a holy bride. He'll be here till that happens. And he's going to dwell in that bride forever. The time comes to remove that bride to heavenly places. Fine. We'll be there with our Lord, but it's not going to happen till the last trump. Why do I emphasize that? Just that you might have your vision clear. That you'll have something to live for. Instead of pinning your hopes on some of these fantastic dates that they're bringing out. First, when was it? September in 88. Now, I got a book the other, oh, a week or two ago. May 29th, I think, it's all over. I'm not making fun of those things, but I mean, God is, it's not all over until God's got what he's after. Not a case of May 29th coming, well, I guess we've got to take that church. It's, it's still full of a lot of infirmity and sin and all that, but after all, uh, you know, uh, they calculated the time I take them. What nonsense. What's he coming for? Instead of calculating, oh, I think this is going to happen. What's, what's God waiting for? 
a date to come in the, our calendar. He's waiting for precious fruit from the earth. He's waiting for a holy bride. He's waiting for a people who have come to the fullness of truth. Until he's waiting for people to come unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That they be no longer children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. So it's down here, all this is happening. The winds of doctrine are blowing down here. All kinds of malice and wickedness mixed along with it. But speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him in all things. Who is the head, even Jesus Christ, from whom the whole body fitly framed and knit together by that which every joint supplieth, maketh increase of the body unto the building up of itself in love. It's God's intention. It's God's declaration. It's His Word sent into the earth. It will remain into the earth till it happens. You say, so I guess we got another 10, 15 years, 20 years, eh? I'm not saying how long. God could do it tonight. I'm saying he's going to do it by his own creative power in a willing people. You say, that's the problem. I wonder if there'll ever be a willing people. So God said, I'm going to have a willing people in the day of my power. He said he's going to have a willing people. Are you willing? God make this people willing. God, put that will in the hearts of your people to say, Lord, I'll do it. I'll go, Lord, where you want me to go. I'll do what you want, Lord. I give you myself, Lord. Make us to be a willing people. It's all he needs to fulfill his promises as a willing people. And so don't wonder about the times of waiting, the times of frustration, the times of persecution, the times of disappointment, the times of sorrow and heartbreak. Don't wonder about that. It's taking that to make you and I willing. But you say, no, I, I mean, God didn't need to do all those hard things in me to make me willing. But uh, when you've gone through some more hardship, you say, Lord, I guess I wasn't as willing as I thought. And eventually you'll say, Lord, take me through anything that's required to make me to be willing. But that's all he wants. You and I to say, I will, Lord. And mean it. And ask him to seal it with his own covenant. To unfold it into his own covenant where he says, I will write my laws in their heart. You say, I will accept it, Lord. I will make them to be my people, Lord. I'll, I'll be part of your people. I'll write my laws in your mind. Thank you, Lord. I, I accept it. Remembering this, that when God comes and speaks to you, Oh, I long for that day and I know it's coming. And God's servants will stand before the people and declare a word from God and it happens right while the word's going forth. Because that's part of the new covenant for God to bring forth according to the word. The same God who said, let there be light and there was light. How long did God have to work in the old creation to cause that word to come forth, I don't know. But the Spirit of God prepared the chaos of the old creation for God to speak, and when He spoke, it happened. You say, is the new covenant somewhat similar? Yes. Paul says, the God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness is the God who has shone in our hearts. To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Same God. Same creative word. Only now he's commanding light to shine in your heart and mind when the Spirit of God has finished moving upon the face of your troubled life, the face of the waters in your life and mine. God speaks. Light shines forth.
Turning to Hebrews chapter 11. I said I was going to talk about a vision, but not in detail as it were, but how the vision works. How the vision that God gives and you get tired waiting for it to be fulfilled. And why does God keep you waiting? He keeps you waiting to prepare your heart. No use of me trying to imagine, but I may mean, get too deep into it. But if God had given me the desire of my heart and sent me forth at the age of 20, 25, 30 to be a minister in the church, I have no idea if I would be here today, if I'd have this a vision such as I have today. Or especially if God had given some success Lots of things happened and I was able to establish churches or go to mission fields and see a great work done. It's very likely that uh, my vision would end with that. God wants to enlarge our vision. He wants to clarify our vision so that we see more clearly. So we speak about various things that God has for the body of Christ. We might call it our inheritance. Healings, gifts of the Spirit, baptism of the Holy Spirit, all kinds of ministrations by the Spirit of truth and wisdom and knowledge, workings of God by the Spirit. We might speak of these various things as our inheritance in God. But if we find a lot of success and a lot of enjoyment and gratification, fulfillment in these areas, the vision that God wants to bring upon us might be in the back burner. So he says to us over and over again in the scripture, in one way or another, I fear lest the promise being left my people of entering into my rest, that some should keep, some, some should seem to come short of it. I don't, he says, I fear that some might come short of my promise. Now God says that to you and I. I don't want you to come short of my promise. But God brings us into some new realm in the Spirit. And it's so wonderful we want to just stay there. And it's good that God leaves us there for a season to enjoy that new realm of the inheritance. Sooner or later, we're going to discover, I don't care where we are now, that there comes a dissatisfaction, uh, an unrest, a sense of, no, this is really not true fulfillment, a sense of, oh, there still must be something more. But it's God who causes that too. In one way or another. He might dry up the springs that's once blessed you so much. He might send trouble. Tribulation. He might send all kinds of difficulties. To work in your heart and mind. His own good pleasure that we might lift up our eyes and see something greater than where we are now. And so tribulation work of patience, but you say that's not that's nothing to glory in. Who wants tribulation and patience as we go through it? No, we don't, but God does. God does. Because God's been going through a lot of tribulation all through the centuries with his people. God says, I I, I get tired of carrying my people. God get weary? I don't think we understand the heart of God too well. God is pained with the pain of his people. God said, I've been in pain. He says, it's going to change. I feel, God says, I feel now like a woman in travail. I'm going to arise and cry out at once. I'm going to arise and destroy 
the evil that's in the world. God says, I've been in pain a long time if I held my peace. It hasn't been easy for God to hold his peace these 6,000 years in the reign of evil. You think it's easy? God had to do that because God's a long-suffering God and he wants you and I to learn long-suffering. You want to be like God? Oh, yes, but do it quick, Lord. What patience you have? Do it right now. God's a God of long suffering in the face of evil. Patient in the face of all kinds of difficulties, God's patient. Merciful to people who don't deserve it. God's that way, you know it. He wants you to be that way. You want to be like Jesus? Well, yes, I want to have that power he had to heal and to do miracles. Maybe walk in the water, that would be that'd be wonderful to have power like that. Or you want divine enablement to manifest patience and long suffering to those who are don't understand you, misunderstand you, abuse you, afflict you. You want long suffering? Yeah, but Lord, you know, only so far. And God won't cause us to be tempted or tested above what we are able to bear. But he has promised he will, with the test, also make a way of escape that we might endure. But what I'm saying really is this, that God keeps us waiting to clarify our vision, to purify our vision, that our vision might be set on the object that God wants us to set our vision on. And it's not gifts, it's not ministry, it's not fulfilling an apostolic or prophetic ministry, it's not going forth as a missionary. God might give you all those things, put those things in your heart, but not to become the vision you, that you pursue. Not to become the vision. And so only God by His grace is able to change that vision that becomes so big in our eyes by leading us in ways that are perplexing and strange, wilderness ways, difficult ways, frustrating ways that where you try to reach the vision and you can't grasp it. If you do feel you got it, it doesn't seem to work. It doesn't seem to glitter the way it did at a distance. Because God does not want your vision to be in anything you do for Him. Ministry or service of any kind must not be your vision. But a duty that God gives you, a precious duty that He gives you, always keeping your eyes upon something that Abraham discovered long after God gave him the promise. Get out of thy country, Abram, and away from your family and relatives to land that I will show you and I will make of you a great nation. That became the vision. It tarried and tarried and tarried. God says, fear not, Abram, I'm your reward. Isn't that enough? As I thought God earnestly about, I don't know, 50 years, 60 years ago, Lord, I, I know you put that call there. What do you really want? What, I want to know what to do. I, I want to do your will. And for, uh, oh, I think a week or so, almost every day, somehow this word would come to me. I think I took it out of a promise box one day. What, O oh man, does the Lord require of thee but to do justly and love mercy and walk humbly with thy God? Nice scripture. Next day or so, same scripture. What, O man, does the Lord require of thee but to do justly and love mercy and walk humbly with thy God? Oh, I forget how many times I got that and I knew God was speaking, but it didn't excite me too much. Still saying with Abram, what are you going to give me? It took a long time, maybe 25 or 30 years to realize realized that that was God's total desire for my life. And at the same time, there was nothing greater in this life or in the life to come 
than if I could fulfill that call. To love mercy, do righteousness, and walk humbly with God. There's no greater call in this earth or in the land to come than to walk with God. Well then, why why the troubling all through your life trying to fulfill something that God said, you know, he's going to give you a ministry. And why struggle trying to fulfill that when God holds out a greater promise? I just want you to walk humbly with me. The only reason I can figure out now why it, I never found rest in it in those early days was because I didn't know God well enough. That's no big deal to walk with God when you're a young man, vibrant, eloquent, and gone to Bible school and know the Bible and ready to preach and travel. Walk with God and all that. Nothing significant about that, is there? You've got your diploma and you've, you've got your talents. And you've, you know, I'm not making fun of young men that are going in the ministry. I am saying, let God enlarge your vision. Till old or young, whatever age you are, it matters nothing. No matter what your abilities are, walk with God. And there's no greater calling in this life than the next. And to walk humbly with your God. And the world is waiting for that kind of a people. Creation is waiting for the manifestation of sons. So they're waiting for for deliverance. They're not waiting for another great prophet or great apostle or teacher, evangelist. They're waiting for sons to begin walking in the sonship of the Lord Jesus. Walking in his steps in union with the Son, and that's nothing more than to the manifestation of the Son or anything less than that, walking with the Son of God being revealed in your life. The Son of God might be revealed now as we live in this life. Whether it be in weakness, in poverty, in humility, all that is part of becoming a Son that God's going to reveal in the day of His power. A meek and humble and contrite people, poor in spirit, meek, lowly, suffering with the sufferings of the church, persecuted for righteousness' sake, yet all the while knowing the canopy of the Lord Jesus resting upon them, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. And so will the Son of God be revealed in his many brethren in the earth. And furthermore, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers are raised up by God for this purpose to produce this kind of a people. There are means to an end, and one day they'll fade away. Like Moses and Elijah faded away in the Mount of Transfiguration, when the glory of God comes down on the Mount, we're going to see Jesus only. The ministry fades away in the cloud. Immersed in the cloud of God's glory, yes, they're still there, immersed in the cloud of God's glory. But Jesus alone is seen as the Lamb reigning on the throne of glory. With regard to vision, I say, let God clarify, purify the vision we have. Give us clear eyesight that we might see what God wants us to see. That's why He keeps us waiting. That's the reason for the perplexity. That was the reason for the perplexity in Abraham. That he might come to understand what God meant way back there when he said, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield and I am thy reward. It didn't dawn on him then. He didn't know God well enough. Yeah, I know God, you're my reward, but why don't you do something? Why don't you give me something? God says, I'm giving you myself, Abraham. What more do you want?
By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, Hebrews 11 and 8, obeyed and he went out, not knowing whither he went. But notice this. By faith he went out to find the place that God had promised. When he found it, he found himself a foreigner in the land. I never noticed that clearly until a short time ago. He went out into the place which God would give him for an inheritance. He obeyed. He went out, not knowing whither he went. He found the land of promise. And he sojourned in the land of promise as in a foreign country. Dwelling in tents, tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. And why did he dwell in tents? I mean, why, at least, did the Holy Spirit see fit to mention here that Abraham, when he found the land of promise, he dwelt in tents with Isaac and Jacob. Because Abraham said, I found the land of promise, but I'm a foreigner in it. It was no big deal to him. I wish, and I long for the day when the true gospel will go to Israel, telling them, yes, God has given you this land, that's all very wonderful, but listen, don't set your hopes upon it. God's got something better than this land of Palestine. It's a city that Abraham looked forward to, a city that has foundations whose builder and maker is God. Abraham, your forefather, he was here, he dwelt here, and the land was much more beautiful than it is now. It's fertile and abundant in its fruit. A good land, but Abraham says, I'm going to dwell here in a tent with Isaac, my son, and Jacob, my grandson, because we've caught a vision of something better, a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He saw the city we're looking for. He's found it. The true inheritance because that city is nothing less than the people of God in whom God dwells in his fullness. John said, come hither and I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he saw what? The holy city. Come down from God out of heaven, adorned as a bride, adorned for her husband. That was what God was doing in leading Abraham as a stranger, even when he found the land of promise. He was still a foreigner in it. Didn't even have a place to bury Sarah when she died. Though he dwelt right in the land of promise. And they wanted to give it to him. He said, no, I won't accept it as a gift because I'm a stranger, I'm a foreigner. He refused to say, this is really my land anyway. Thanks, I'll take it. He said, I'm going to be a foreigner. I want my posterity to know that I'm a stranger in this land, a foreigner. Because I found something better. I've seen something better. A city not made with hands. Whose brightest, most glorious. John saw no temple in that city. For the Lord God was the temple and the Lamb was the temple. He saw no light for the glory of God did lighten it. The people of the living God, the church of the living God, composed of men, women from all tribes, kindreds, tongues, nations, including the remnant from the land of Israel. That's the city that God's prepared. Let that be our vision. The Zion, the city of the living God, that's the inheritance we've come to. Where God is the light thereof, and God is the king thereof, and Christ is the high priest of that city. And the inhabitants of that city are holy and just and pure by the blood of the Lamb, and they're going to worship and adore the Lamb throughout all ages. A Lamb who reigns upon the throne, retaining the marks of his sacrifice in his hand and in his side. Not his infirmities. So I used to think, why didn't God heal those wounds? Until I realized those wounds were not an infirmity in his glorified flesh. They were the tokens and badges of his triumph. Over all evil forces he triumphed because of the, he was the bleeding lamb. Because he overcame evil with good. Because he overcame light with darkness. Because he overcame hate with love. That's how we're going to overcome. If we follow the lamb whithersoever he leads us. 
Lord, we pray that you would take away the scales from our eyes, that we might see those things that you want us to see. We might set our hearts upon those things which are above, not on things which are upon the earth. That we are dead as far as this old creation life is concerned, and our life is hid with Christ in God. For we have now come unto Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable host of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. And to God, the judge of all, and the spirits of just men, made perfect Abraham's there, and Moses, and Elijah, saints of all, we've come to that city. We're one with them. And to the city of the living God, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than the blood of Abel, for the blood of the Lamb cleanses from all sin. Make real to us, we pray, by giving us vision, Lord, to see the glories of your redemption. Cause us to know where our real inheritance lies. It's in you. For God said to the priests in Israel, they shall have no inheritance among your brethren, for I will be their inheritance. Be our inheritance, Lord, and make your inheritance in us. Help us to abide in you that you might be our inheritance and take us to be your inheritance. For so it is written, abide in me and I in you. Cause us to know, Lord, that mystical relationship in a way such as we've never imagined. For we realize, Lord, that there is much, much more to that than just quoting the scripture, but that there's a place in God where we live in God and walk in God and move in God and Christ lives in us and abides in us and because the, becomes the fountain that springs forth from our life in healing to the nations about us. Bless your word, Lord. Confirm it to the hearts of your people and cause it to work in those that believe even as you have desired. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.